Hey, you know, sermons work better when the preacher turns the microphone on. That's my fault. <laughs> Good morning. Man, it's glad, I'm glad to be back here. It's been a couple of years, but, uh, but it seems like yesterday. We had a delightful time yesterday. Uh, and I'm certainly excited to be here this morning to, uh, to get to worship the Lord with you and to talk about the book of Daniel, which, uh, which is one of those books, kind of like the book of Revelation, that, that we're okay with it, kind of. Like, we're, we're okay with it being in the Bible because God put it in the Bible, but, man, once you get past chapter 6 into 7, it gets wild. And so we talked about some of that yesterday. Thankfully, this morning, we're going to be in Daniel 6, so you should feel right at home. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6 and, you know, use your device if you need to. Uh, if you don't have the Bible app on your phone, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes and give you time to download it. So go ahead and just turn to Daniel 6. Um, one of the things, though, I want us to be, keep in mind as we're looking at the Scripture this morning is this. Small decisions can have significant consequences. It doesn't have to be huge. But small decisions, small shifts, can have significant consequences. Here in a couple of hours, I'm going to get on a plane. And aviation, like, like the people that are in the aviation industry, they understand this principle. Matter of fact, uh, for, for airplane pilots, there's what's called the 1 in 60 principle. That if the nose of the plane is off by one degree then every 60 miles that you travel, you are one mile away from your intended destination. Which means, if you're just one degree off, then the further that you travel, the further away from your intended destination. This was quite significant for a group on November 28, 1979. It was the sightseeing trip that, that left from New Zealand and was sightseeing over Antarctica, and they were, they were traveling just two degrees off. Just two degrees off. And the longer they went, the further they got from their destination. And as visibility went down, they were 27 miles off of their intended course. And without the ability to really see much, they didn't see the mountain that they slammed into the side of. Small decisions, small shifts can have significant consequences. I talk about this to my students at Ozark whenever we very first start the course. Every one of my courses, I start with what I call syllabus week. We take a week of class to go through the syllabus. And I explain to them up front, I'm like, listen, it's not, I'm going to go through the syllabus not because I don't think you can read. I believe at this point in college, you can read. I said, but you know what? I said, I have no problem giving you an F in my class, but I do have a problem if it's because I've not communicated clearly my expectations. So we're going to take a week, we're going to all get on the same page, and we're going to calibrate what I expect in this class. But then once I start going through the policies and the procedures, I can't help myself. I like stop and I start to preach. It's just kind of in the blood at this point. As a matter of fact, in my office, I have this little picture that sits by my desk my parents always told me, and I, I, now I have photographic evidence, but it's this photograph of me at three. They said, Shane, whenever our family got together, you were either dancing like Michael Jackson or you're standing up on the couch preaching. So apparently, they said that my, my favorite sermons was to talk about how these people need to repent or they're going to hell, and it was my family. So apparently, I saw some things they needed to correct. Anyway, it's in my blood. So even though we're going through policies and procedures, you know, I stop and I kind of talk to them about why. I'm not just throwing stuff into the syllabus for no reason. I have a reason why. And a lot of it has to do with my love for them and for the church. So I even tell my seniors, I say, I have no problem flunking you, even though you're wanting to graduate. Why? Because if you can't do what I'm expecting, then you're telling me you need six more months before you go out into the church. And the church deserves your best. So when we get to cheating or plagiarism, my initial thing I say to them is I say, don't do it. Like that's, that's, yeah, really profound. Don't cheat. And then I explain why, though. I say, you know, what's interesting to me is over the last 15 years, I, I've been out of college now for 20 years. I said, over the last 15 years, I, I've been watching the people that I trained in ministry with 
that were my roommates or were just right down the hall or graduated on the same stage that I did. I watch one by one their ministries fall. Their families fall apart. Them literally just get pushed out of the ministry, not because of the evil of the other people, because of things that they had done. Some of them with moral failings, having adulterous affairs. Some of them addicted to pornography. Consistently, their, their, their lives fell apart, and as they did, I would sit there and I would go, you know what was interesting is I remember there was actually one of my really close friends, he, he had this happen to him, where his ministry fell apart because of an adulterous affair. And I sat there and went, you know what's interesting is I remember how at the end of a semester he would brag that he hadn't read a single book, even though he confessed that he had read 100% of the books and got B's in all of his classes. I remember some of the other people down the hall where they would, they would, they would, they would actually get excited about the fact that they tricked the professor by plagiarizing on their paper not having written it themselves, and they still got an A. And my thought was this. The adulterous affair didn't begin when they caught eyes with that other person. It began 15 years earlier when they were discipling themselves in deception. It was one degree off. But one degree off, the further that you travel, the farther away you get from your intended destination. Which means we might want to pay attention to where we're headed. And this is what I always tell my students. I say, because here's the reality. Here's the truth. Every decision you make, you become someone different. Every decision you make, you're becoming someone different. Here's the question. Who are you becoming? More like Jesus or less? Like that should be the metric for us Christians. That should be the ruler, the measurement. Does this decision draw me closer to Jesus or further away? And sometimes it's easy to not see a connection. It's like, ah, big deal. So I didn't report that on my taxes. Every decision, you become someone different. Ah, big deal. Yeah, I may have really gotten upset and just exploded at that person, but you know what? No big deal. Every decision, you become someone different. Well, you know what? They didn't agree with me politically. So I went after them online on social media. Every decision you make, you become someone different. The question is, who are you becoming? You have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 is not an unfamiliar text, but we're going to look at it maybe with an unfamiliar lens. Daniel chapter 6 is Daniel and the lion's den. Like, I'm sure that some of you that have either been in children's church or taught children's church, you've heard this story. And a lot of times we get really excited about the end, where Daniel will get thrown into the den of lions, and the lions won't eat him. And we'll get there. But here's what I want to tell you. This story is not about a miracle. This story is about integrity. This story is about being disciplined enough that regardless if people are watching you or not, you are acting the same. Why? Because every decision you make, you become someone different, whether people can see you or they can't. So listen to how this unfolds, Daniel chapter 6. We already read the first 10 verses, but I'm going to kind of go back over them. The first three verses, you see that, that, that Darius is trying to organize better his empire, the empire of Babylon, the pagan kingdom that has actually destroyed Jerusalem and brought Jews to their land. We talked about that yesterday during the sessions. He's brought them there, but he needs to organize it. And Daniel's ability is so significant that Daniel's not just chosen as one of the three that is going to be head over all of these officials. He's actually chosen to be the one that will probably be head over the whole empire. And naturally what happens, envy starts to be sown. The other ones are going, no, 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 no. We've been Babylonian since birth. And now this foreigner is going to come in and take our jobs? No. So what do they do? They look for a way to bring him down, just like typical politicians. No offense. Just like it. We're going to find a way to go after him. Right? So verse 4. The administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel 
in his conduct of government affairs. I love this next line. But they were unable to do so. They couldn't find anything. They're like, let's dig up some dirt. And they go looking and they're like, what if it's squeaky clean? Keep reading. They say, they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. He was responsible, faithful, trustworthy. May that be said of me. May that be said of you. Goodness, Christians, may that be said of us. That when people go and they look for the dirt, they can't find any. Why? Wouldn't it be amazing if you lived a life with no secrets? It's almost weird to even say that. Because it's just so foreign. We don't even know that it's possible. Like, I, my kids know, they know exactly the, the code to get into my phone. They know it. And multiple times, my wife or somebody, they'll need to look up something, and they'll just go over and grab my phone. And you know what I never do? I never go, whoa, 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 whoa what are you doing? Like, put that down. You need me to help you with something? Have you ever seen somebody do that? What do you immediately think when somebody's doing that? It's okay, I know it's a sermon, but you're allowed to talk to me. It's, I'm a teacher. What's that? Seems like they're hiding something. I, I, I may have told this illustration a couple years ago, but I speak in a lot of different places. I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell it again, okay? My wife, not too long ago, it was actually in 2020. My wife was, uh, was we, she was in the kitchen, and I was sitting at the kitchen table, and we were, I was working on stuff, and my daughter comes over, and she's like, hey, I learned something at school today. And I was like, cool, what is it? And she goes, here, watch this. Let me see your computer. And I was like, all right. So I slid it over, and she pressed this button. It was like some hot key where you just press a couple of things, and things happen. She pressed it, and all of a sudden, you know, what I was on, like I was looking at my email, something shifted on the browser. And I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh. I was like, this is my browsing history. She goes, yeah, all you got to do is press this and press H, and then it pops up. And I was like, do you want to go through it? And she was like, sure. And I was like, okay. I said, well, here's where your Uncle Jordy was telling me about something to do with, you know, the history of the church fathers. And so I went there. Here's whenever I was, oh, that was whenever the Boston Celtics were losing. That's why I was over there. Here's where, and we went through like five pages. Finally, she's like, all right, I'm good, and left. And I went back to my work, and my wife looked at me, and she goes, you know, you just ruined our daughter, didn't you? And I said, I'm sure I did. Just please tell me why. <laughs> and she goes, no other man will ever let her do that on their browsing history. Now, here's what's interesting. I just told two illustrations where I was the hero. But it wouldn't be a hero if everybody did this. It would just be what we do. Problem is, we have so many secrets, we don't even know how to keep up with most of them. And so we make sure we have passcodes on everything that only we know, and we even blame it on things like rights and privacy. What if somebody was trying to take you down? And what if they couldn't find a single thing to use against you? Hear me when I say this. It is possible. And hear me whenever I say this. And that's what Christians are called to be and to do. And if you don't agree with that, just let me just tell you, the nose of your plane is just one degree off. It's just one degree off. And the further you go, the further away from your intended destination. But not with Daniel. They're looking for it, and they're like, man, we can't find anything on this guy. Then verse 5, his reputation comes to haunt him. Verse 5, finally these men said, all right, you know what, here's the truth. We're never going to find anything against this guy. We'll never find basis for charges against this man Daniel, unless... It has something to do with the law of his God. Oh, may that be said of me. And may that be said of you. And of Christians. That the only way they can trip us up is if they find a way to tempt us with compromising what we love the most, and that's God himself. That's his only weakness. That he loves God too much. So what do they do? Well, they, they go to Darius and they set a trap. Darius loves Daniel. That's the crazy thing of this. This pagan ruler loves this Jewish person of God. But they're like, hey, Darius, we have an idea. 
why don't you set out a decree that no one can pray to any other God or any other person except to you for the next, just 30 days, just 30 days. It's just going to be the month of Darius. What's wrong with that? And Darius is like, well, I mean, a bunch of other kings have done a lot of other crazier stuff. This might help us unify as a people. Yeah, let's do it. No one can pray to anybody but to me for the next 30 days. And his good buddy Daniel hears it. Verse 10. When Daniel learned about the decree that it had been published, what does he do? He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. There's a couple of things in that I find very interesting. And it doesn't typically match the way I see Christians really getting angry at the government today. Like, typically Christians there are like, oh yeah, we, we definitely, if the government's going to tell me something, they're not taking away my Christian freedom, and we go after them. Social media, violating the laws, and making a scene of it. Daniel doesn't make a scene. He goes back to his prayer closet and says, hey, God, we, I just, I want to talk with you. But notice what it also says. He goes back to God and gives God thanks. Gratitude is the foundation of his relationship between God. Not complaining. Not demanding God to do something so that what he gets is the foundation of what the, why it is he's worshiping God. No, Daniel goes back, even after he hears a decree that is outlawing praying, he goes back and says, I need to talk to my best friend, and we're going to start with being grateful. I'm telling you, one degree, one degree makes significant differences. Daniel, though, is the same whether he's in public or whenever he's not, and that's the definition of integrity. That regardless if somebody looks at you and they're interacting with you like this, whether they're on a stage or they're off the stage, whether they're at home or they're in church, they act the same no matter where they go. That's integrity. And that today is as rare as a precious jewel. We even have phrases like this, you know, like, well, that person, they seem kind of two-faced. They act this way over here. They act this way over here. But here's the truth. That should never be a Christian. You know, I, I am exhausted is not the right word. Maybe it is. Angry, maybe. Brokenhearted, probably. I am really sick and tired, though, of ministers not acting like Christians. Like even just the other day, you hear of a minister that on the stage is preaching the gospel, off the stage, abusing his wife. And I would love to say like, wow, that's the first time I've heard that. That's not even the first time I've heard that in the past two months. Christian leaders, what are you doing? Stop making the witness more difficult because you refuse to have integrity. If you're going to stand on a stage and hide your secrets, just get off the stage. You're not helping anything. But hear me, I'm not just talking to Christian ministers. I'm talking to Christians. Our greatest evangelistic tool is our integrity. But the greatest thing that destroys our witness is whenever what we say and what we do, whether in public or in private, don't match. Because if you're doing that to your wife, or you're doing that to your husband, or you're doing that to your employees, then maybe what you even say about Jesus doesn't really match. You're probably hiding something there too. Like you really want to be a church that reaches out to a community and brings them in? Learn how to live like Jesus regardless of your setting regardless of your situation, regardless of whoever it is is in charge of your government, like Daniel. Daniel didn't choose to be in Babylon. He's there in exile. Daniel was taken from the promised land and brought to this place. And what does he do? He goes to God with prayers of thanksgiving. He doesn't pull out his phone and start tweeting things about how, how upset he is. No, Daniel actually puts his time and his energy into the things that matter the most. 
Because he understands that every decision you make, you become someone different. The question is, are you becoming more like Christ or less? Oh, when Darius hears what Daniel has done, Darius is like, you've got to be kidding me. I totally forgot about like one of my favorite people. I should have known Daniel was going to pray no matter what because I know his relationship with his God is, is the most important thing. I know this. But Darius is like, ah, but the law is the law. What are we going to do? So Darius says, all right, get Daniel, prepare the lion's den. And he's distraught, he's distressed. Verse 15, then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order. And they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, who you serve, whether you are at the mouth of the lion's den or in it, may your God, who you serve continually, may he rescue you. Why? Because I can't even rescue you now. The next verse, all of a sudden I go, this sounds familiar. So Daniel has this trumped up situation that, that he's convicted guilty of something simply because he is innocent of doing anything. That to me sounds familiar. Then he is thrown into a den, which basically is supposedly going to become his tomb. And what does it say in verse 17? A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the tomb. Come on. Does that sound familiar? The stone is placed in front, and the king seals it with his signet ring, with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed, that no one's going to in any way uh, alter this situation. The signet ring. And if they do, the full force of the Babylonian Empire comes down on them. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. His friend had been betrayed by him. Then notice this, verse 19. At the first light of dawn, sound familiar? Stone rolled first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, um, yeah, <laughs> he did. And this is crazy. Daniel walks out of his tomb alive. Sound familiar? Here's why I find this interesting. Daniel's integrity was centered in his identity that was rooted to his worship of God, whether he was on a stage or not. And it was not dictated by what he got or did not get. For even whenever he was facing the mouth of the lion's den, not knowing if God would protect him, he still was faithful to the Lord. Because he understands that every decision you become someone different. And yes, in this situation, he is preserved alive. But that not every single lion's den do the mouths of the lions stay closed. This entire story is not about a miracle. It's about identity. It's about integrity. It's about being committed to God regardless of the consequences. That's what this is about. And here's what's interesting. Daniel in the Old Testament, the end of this story, he looks a lot like Jesus from the New Testament. Christians, I know that we have heroes of the faith, but we also have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And I, this is going to sound weird to say, but I'm going to say, don't let Daniel in the Old Testament outdo your integrity here in the New Testament under Jesus' grace. He looks like Jesus at the end because that's what happens whenever you're united to God. That's what happens when you are dedicated to the Lord. That's what happens when you have no secrets, whenever you have nothing that you are hiding. It's what happens whenever you are solely focused on being dedicated to God and God alone. And it even comes down to how he is treating his enemies. Isn't it interesting that it is the pagan king of a pagan empire that is the most distraught for this faithful person of God? 
Like I was talking to uh, somebody earlier, and, and it reminded me of the situation that, that I have. Yeah, believe it or not, I, I get some nasty emails every once in a while after I preach and teach or stuff like that. Um, you know, if you have something you're upset about, Mark Seaver's emails is a great place to send things. So go ahead and just fill that up. I'm sure he'll forward it along. Um, no, but I got one, and they were just coming at me because I was refusing to vocally go against somebody in a political situation they wanted me to go against. And I just said, you know, I want to be like Paul. In Acts chapter 19, Paul is in the city of Ephesus. I don't know if you know the story. The city of Ephesus, though, was the center of worship of this goddess named Artemis. And they were so upset with what the gospel was doing in the city that they started for two and a half hours, 25,000 people packed into an amphitheater chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And Paul is so wild with the gospel. He's like, let me go preach to him. And they're like, no, 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 no. He's like, no, no, I'm gonna go preach to him. Why? There's 25,000 people in an amphitheater. It's a captive audience. I'm gonna go preach them Jesus. And then it says this. The city clerks held him back. Begged him not to go. Terrified their friend would be torn apart. Why that's interesting to me is that city clerks would have been the rulers or the priests of pagan temples. Paul was in such a, a situation of integrity that he loved his friends and his enemies the way that Jesus did that his enemies were even fighting for his protection. Oh, that may that be said of me. Oh, may that be said of you. Oh, may that be said of Christians during a political season. That we love Jesus so much that we refuse to use the weapons of the evil one to attack even people that we disagree with. Even though we disagree, we refuse to attack them and annihilate them the way that a lion would to its prey. And instead... We go to the Lord with thanksgiving, trusting that even as Babylon is crushing us underneath its weight, that he is the one that is sovereign, he is the one that is supreme, and he is the one that we seek even more than positions of power. Because ultimately, you cannot control Babylon, but you can control who you're becoming with every decision that you make. Let, let, let me pray over us. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus.